This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the Southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, your timing is perfect. Kenny and I were just saying how much we love our jobs, That's right. how much we love being with you every week, and how much we really, really love this particular show because it has everything. Yes, that is right. So without further delay, here's what's coming up. Struggling with stress and mental health? Find out how one Georgia department is stepping in to help farmers in need and how 988 is becoming a lifeline for those in the ag community. Forget tractors, agribusiness offers high-tech careers. See what wowed students at the Rockdale Career Day Expo. Plus, a special reflection on the 10-year anniversary of the documentary, Farmland. We're sitting down with the Cooley family, who were featured in the film to discuss the impact since its release and how farming has evolved since then. These stories and so much more start right now. In Georgia, mental health among farmers is a pressing issue. In fact, a recent survey revealed that a disturbing 29% have contemplated suicide. John Holcomb tells us the ways in which state leaders are now acknowledging the need for improved resources. Weather, input prices, commodity prices, these are just a handful of the things that are out of a farmer's control and are the reasons why so many struggle with stress and mental health issues. It's a real problem across the country and is something Kevin Tanner, Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, finds deeply troubling and is something he's seen firsthand. For me, having been born in that lifestyle and raised on a farm and having a farm of my own, I know what it's like to have that generational farm where you're looking at seven generations of people before me have farmed in North Georgia they've had land in this in this state um, you don't want to be the generation for that to end and then the other thing about being a farmer you know if you're in if you work for a company you're getting a paycheck every week every two weeks you know exactly what you're getting paid and if it rains or if a storm comes through you're still getting a paycheck but as a farmer there's so many things you can do the very best job you can but there's so many things out of our control in recent years, the topic of mental health has found its way into the spotlight, as there is less stigma surrounding the topic. In Georgia, the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities has even formed a hotline for those in need to be able to call, which Tanner says is just the tip of the iceberg. 988 is more than a phone number, um, because you can call 988 as a law enforcement officer, as a family member, as someone who needs help themselves whatever the case might be, and it may be something as simple as calling 988 to say, I've been depressed lately, I've got a lot of things going on financially, and I need someone I can talk to, and, they, and I have a certain type of insurance. They can help connect you to a community-based service. It may be a family member calling to say, my child is in mental health crisis and I need help. 988 can dispatch a mobile crisis team anywhere in the state of Georgia. So they will come and meet you where you are. And I think that's important for people to understand. So it's more than just talking to someone on the phone. If you need the resource, they'll come to you. In the end, Tanner says regardless of zip code or occupation, 988 is a resource for all, but understands the complexities of mental health challenges within the ag community and wants to reassure that help is just a phone call away. I just think that it's important for the farming community to know how much they're appreciated. Because um, so, so many people don't understand where their food comes from and they just take those things for granted. But I just want our farming community to know that I appreciate the sacrifices they meet, meet, make each and every day. And there's a lot of us that feel that way and that we are here ready to stand up and provide the resources they need to be successful um, because they are the backbone of our state, number one industry in our state, and they're the backbone of our country. Reporting in Atlanta for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. In Georgia, where agriculture sustains over one in seven jobs, maintaining a reliable workforce is paramount to the industry's future. 
That's why events like the recent Agribusiness Career Expo in Rockdale County hold such significance, opening doors for students to explore the diverse array of opportunities within the agricultural sector. Damon Jones brings us the story from Conyers. The days of agriculture being known as just sows, cows, and plows is now a thing of the distant past. And that was never more apparent than here at the Rockdale Career Academy, where hundreds of students got an up-close look at all of the exciting careers within the ag industry. What do we need to do uh, to assist students throughout the state to ensure that they are aware of over 300 agribusiness careers throughout the state? And so this is the inaugural Agribusiness Career Day Expo here at Rockdale Career Academy in, in Conyers, Georgia. So we have 38 industry professionals here today from all areas of agribusiness, which is our largest business in the state of Georgia. With so many different fields being represented, there are no shortage of options, no matter where your interests might lie. You can be a plumber, you can be a welder, you can be a technician and have a wonderful job at an independent repair facility or maybe John Deere or one of our large uh, uh, dealerships, maybe Honda, uh, Ford, Nissan, uh, General Motors, because in agribusiness you need to have everything. It's also a sector that is all inclusive with people of all ages and nationalities working together in order to keep the state's number one industry running strong. Sharing this information with all types of individuals, male, female, whatever culture you're from, to get them to have the exposure and go. And hopefully we're gonna get some great wows out of this today. And again, this supports the K through 12 agribusiness, STEM program, and all of those types of programs that the uh, schools have throughout the state. And this is just the beginning as more events like this are being planned all across the state in order to reach a wide range of students looking to choose their career path. The plan is to introduce these types of informational expos uh, around the state. We plan to have 10 of them over time, which again will increase the knowledge of our student base to say, you might want to be a biologist or a chemist you're in, and be in the agribusiness field. In this day and time, uh, all employers are looking for great employees, so the more that we can educate them and to have a great future as they move onward, whether it be in the trades or whether going to a two-year technical college system, I think the exposure, getting everybody together at once and go, oh, Wow, so that it's the wow today. Reporting from Rockdale County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. After the break, a decade since an award-winning documentary captured farm life. We're reflecting on its impact with the Cooley family featured in that film. Are the challenges still relevant today? That's next when the Farm Monitor continues. If you are or know Georgia Farm Bureau members ages 18 to 35, listen up. Registration is now open for the Young Farmers and Ranchers Summer Leadership Conference. This annual event will take place on Jekyll Island July 17th through 20th, 2024. At this conference, we are equipping and preparing the future of agriculture to lead our industry. Join fellow young farmers from across the state for a time of growth and networking. Conference activities include relevant breakout sessions, wife and our award competitions, keynote speakers, Johnny Joey Jones and Kevin and Lydia Yun of Yun Family Farms, a fish fry with live music, a social and much more. Registration closes June 1st, so head to gfb.ag slash YFRSLC to sign up. We can't wait to see you there. This month marks a significant milestone in agricultural history. It's been 10 years since the release of Farmland, a documentary that follows the trials and triumphs of six American farmers, including the Cooley family from Roberta, Georgia. 
Recently, I had the privilege of spending a day with the Coolies discussing the impact, if any, the film had on bridging that gap between farmers and consumers. Also, as we reflect a decade later, the question was asked, has the film stood the test of time? Most people don't think about where their food comes from and that it's not manufactured in a supermarket. A lot has changed for you personally since then. Kids are a lot older now. Absolutely. You've got, uh, they're helping you out here on the farm. Um, you've got some new additions. <laughs> Absolutely. You have some new titles, uh, district director, board member, things like that. Um, what advice, if you could, Leighton, if you could go back and talk to Leighton Cooley of 2014, what advice would you have for him now? Holy smokes, that's a big question to start out with. <laughs> There'd be a whole list. There'd be an absolutely a whole list What would of be things. the most important thing? Oh gosh, uh, you know, the most important thing would certainly start with my faith. Uh -huh. Look at things a whole lot more through a, a true spiritual lens than just a physical lens of life and, and things. Um, I would like to think that I'd, if I could go back 10 years, I'd probably be a better son, a better husband and a better father <laughs> with, with what I've uh, just, the growth that I have had over the last 10 years and maturity. Behind every good farmer, I have learned <laughs> there is a good wife and you have a good wife in Brenda. Absolutely. They really didn't touch on that Absolutely. a lot in the film, but she's your rock. Absolutely. 10 years after farming and yeah, we're still married. We just celebrated 18 years wow. in this past March. And so uh, that's incredible. I can't, you know, it's, it's just hard to even think about. But, um, or it's just hard to imagine that I'm old enough to be married for 18 years. You, you know, realize but... I just made, scored huge points with Brenda, right? Absolutely, 100%. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure she knows about this. <laughs> but no, uh, so Brenda, everybody thinks that Brenda grew up on a, on a farm because she's so farm oriented. I tell people she's the most mechanically inclined female that I know. She can run any piece of equipment. Um, she does 75% of our round bailing during the summer. Um, she's cutting hay, she's doing whatever. Lawson just kind of took over for a lot of, you know, some of her jobs around there. But um, she's 100% involved in the farm. You know, she, she does work off farm two days a week in the school system. She's doing some contract therapy um, with our local school system. But the other three and a half, four days, she's, she's there with the farm. She, take, she took over um, taking care of all of our books um, and hands on. She loves the beef cows, she loves the hay and she's right there in the mix of all of it. Farming being multi-generational, I've been asked a question so many times, you know, why is that? And one of the things that I realized is you really can't build a farm in one lifetime. Mm -hmm. They can keep growing and building, and that's been one of the coolest things. You know, I grew up on this farm, working, work, I grew up on this farm working with Daddy every afternoon, every weekend, you know, get out of school, and that's what we did. We played sports, but we also worked and um, just grew to love it. And so now, especially since Farmland, 10 years later, I've got three boys. Um, Lawson's 13, almost 14, Lane's 12, and Ledger's nine. And all three of those guys love the farm. They really do. I mean, when we, when we talk about it, they enjoy it. They light up. When we, we pray, thanking the Lord for that, that we have the privilege of, of living on a farm. Not every day's easy, not every job's easy, but we love the life that we live. We always have enjoyed sharing our passion about agriculture. We always have wanted to let people know exactly what we do here on the farm. We're real proud of what we do here and um, we've enjoyed sharing it. But it was kind of difficult to share and back in when farmland was filmed, we were doing field trips, but of course you'd have to suit and boot, open the doors of the chicken houses and um, everything would kind of roll out with the fans, a lot of dust, a lot of things that um, weren't real pleasant, so to speak, but, um, and then of course there was biosecurity was a big issue, so it was difficult to show people the chicken houses. So we've built the Learning Center since then and expanded what we do. We do a lot more field trips now and they're a little more, um, they're easier to do and, and the kids get a real, real good view of what's going on inside of the chicken house without going in the chicken house. Mm -hmm. And when you look back at that documentary, Miss Terry, did it, did it really kind of hit home the family values of farm life? Sure, that was one of our goals. That was something that we really wanted people to see was how much farming means to our family. It's more than just a job, as a lot of people say. Um, it is something that we're passionate about, something we enjoy doing, and something that we just live 24-7, as all farmers know. And, um, 
and I was pleased that they did, I think, kind of capture that, and I hope, I hope that was the message that was portrayed, in, um, and I, I feel like it, it did. I feel like it did a good job with that. You know, I think I said something in the uh, film about, you know, you wasn't supposed to brag, but uh, at the same time, uh, how can you tell a story like that without uh, bragging a little bit? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're very proud. We're very proud that we were picked to uh, do the film. Uh, we don't take it for granted that it was just uh, something that was put there and uh, we done it. Uh, uh, we, uh, it gave us a chance to uh, show what we do, what uh, other farmers do and, and how we, uh, uh, in, in one way or another, we're, we're all the same as uh, farmers. Um, you know, when people look at me, I want them to see farmer, and that's what I am. And when people look at me, I want farmer to come out of their mouth. He's a farmer. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, there's no better occupation in the world than to uh, be called an American farmer. As far as the issues that were touched upon, um, have those issues, has that documentary stood the test of time to those issues, or so much more has happened since then. Uh, yes, and both. Yeah. You know, so much more has happened. We're in an ever-changing, um, we're in an ever-changing world. We're in an ever-changing uh, political climate, ever-changing consumer mindset, if you will. And um, so those have still, those are still just as pertinent in my thoughts as, you know, those issues were. We were talking about animal welfare. You know, we were talking about labor issues. We are talking about climate. Um, we're talking about all kinds of things in the farmland documentary. Um, on top of that was so what is it that consumers are really looking for in their food and in agriculture. And so yeah, it has completely stood the test of time with that. Um, we're still dealing with the same issues. Right. You know, right now, I, th I like to think that that community's made improvements on that. Um, I like to think that farmland did an incredible job at just bridging the gap of not just telling the story, but to me helping viewers become part of the story. Let's talk hypotheticals here. I'm a film producer. I got a million dollars. I come to you and I say, Layton, here's a million dollars. I want you to make Farmland 2. What would that look like to you? Farmland 2, wow. There's not something well, else I think we you can... would say, let's split the yeah, million dollars. something else we can do film. with the money. That's funny. <laughs> but no, no. If, you had to, if you had to be put in charge of Farmland 2, what would it look like? That's a really good question. Um, number one, you know, I always say it'd be fun to do a sequel just Sure. do a sequel um but what i think it would do is it would continue to get to tell the story with different farmers i really think that's what it would do but basically one of the things when when, when james said we're going to we're going to tell this story through the eyes of the farmer there was no narrative overlay every word said in there came from a farmer's mouth if you go back and, and watch it yep. and i think it would do the same thing i think it would continue to tell the story from uh, maybe a different perspective but it's all the same story of where our food comes from what about issues what issues would i you mean our, you know we cover issues we, i'm sure it would still come up animal welfare that's mm -hmm. a constant issue you know that we want to do as good a job as we can at taking care of our birds and taking care of our cattle and we want people to know that um, we would still talk about labor right now. I mean, we're trying to get a farm bill passed and, and labor is a huge part of what farmers are dealing with right now. We're trying to, you know, there's, there's changes to H2A, different needs, different things. At the end of the day, farmers still need labor, you know, to help get some of these crops out of the field that machines just can't do. And so we're still gonna be talking about those things. We're gonna be talking about water, just like David talked about with his pivots in Nebraska. Um, you know, we're still gonna be talking about these issues but I think those are age old issues that we'll constantly talk about, we'll constantly balance. I think we'll improve them um, along the way is what I hope we'll, we'll always do. Great family, aren't they? Now, in case you haven't seen the film, it's available on pretty much any platform you can think of, Amazon Prime, iTunes, Google Play Movies, yes, even YouTube. Up next, an inside look at coffee bean farming and the inspiration it provided to this local entrepreneur. everybody, Ray and Kenny from the Farm Monitor. Would you like to receive the Farm Monitor directly to your inbox each week? Turns out you can. Yeah, every Monday morning we'll send out an email with our segments and features from the previous week, along with a link to the show known as Farm Monitor Weekly. The best part? It's free. Just go to farm-monitor.com and click on the subscribe tab to sign up.
As farmers, we all know too well how many things can go wrong. As we grow, we learn to trust in people we can count on the most when times is hard. When it comes to mental health, farmers are not sure where to turn. And then we realize we can turn to UGA Extension to help us in more ways than one. As a resource for farmers, families, and communities across Georgia, we at the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Service provide resources to help beyond the field, especially in times of stress. Because we know farming's not easy, but you don't have to do it alone. Whether you need a helping hand for your farm or your health, we are here for you. Extension is here to help you. Just reach out. We're here to help you. Finally this week, from the hardworking farmers in Ecuador to the team here in Georgia, that is the foundation Z Beans Coffee was built upon. Yeah, interestingly enough, its founder Shane Beerster started his college trek with dreams of a career in baseball. But as Jennifer Parson tells us, a mission trip carved out a different path for Shane. So this is a mural that's common at a lot of our coffee shops. And so this first here on the left, that's Arturo. Shane Beerster's journey in business started as a student at Mercer University. I started Z Beans after a Mercer on mission trip uh, the summer of 2016. So we went down to Ecuador to see if coffee was a viable alternative to gold mining. He took a Spanish class and an economic class while studying abroad. That's where he met Arturo. Arturo toured him around the country, introducing him to coffee farmers in the area. Agriculture in Ecuador really is life. They left that first trip with the conclusion that they couldn't supply enough coffee in just that one town, but the mission wasn't over yet. After countless weekly conversations with his tour guide turned friend, the idea of exporting coffee not just from one town, but from many was born. His journey started with coffee only, but that wasn't enough for Shane. While the coffee business was doing well, it only provided work for the local residents once a year. And so what I wanted to do was try to find a way to create daily job. And what I landed on was chocolate. My focus has been since building Z-Beans is to make one thing a non-negotiable, and that is that we're gonna pay our farmers really well for the, the hard work that they're putting in to, to produce quality product. And in January of 2020, they opened their own chocolate processing facility in Zaruma, the namesake, or rather where the Z in Z beans comes from. We do all of the processing, you know, at the chocolate uh, factory, just like our coffee, we buy from small farmers um, throughout Ecuador, and um, we process it down and refine it to one kilogram blocks. And so these one kilo blocks are 100% chocolate, so very strong, very bitter, but we then take that down and melt it down into our chocolate sauce. The process is similar to that of coffee, taking weeks for the cacao beans to dry. But once you remove the uh, the nibs from the mazorca, like it'll have the, the same kind of like viscous substance around it, and then you can actually like suck on them and it's, it's really sweet, or it could be kind of sour, you know, depending on the, the variety of the chocolate you'll um, allow it to ferment in huge vats and then put them on drying beds so they could you know, completely uh, dry out. Just like coffee, it'll have this chaff that'll come off of it. And so you wanna willow away and remove all of the chaff. And then once you have you know, that, you're able to just crush down the, the cocoa nibs and you crush them, crush them, crush them, blow out all the, uh, the, the chaff that remains crush, crush more, blow out the chaff that remains, and then run it through a grinder. And we just keep grinding it, keep grinding it, keep grinding it until it starts separating the ground nibs versus the cocoa butter. The butter is a liquid form that'll come out with the chocolate. From there, Arturo will put them into molds, and then from the molds, we'll you know, allow them to harden. They export the chocolate to the U.S. in big coolers. It's important for the chocolate to be very hard before its trip to the States so it doesn't arrive in a big melted mess. Once it gets here, we'll freeze the, the kilos of chocolate down and then put them into our mixture that we have for our sauce. We bottle it up and then distribute it directly to our uh, coffee shops. They use that chocolate sauce in their mochas and hot chocolates. Our mochas and hot chocolates definitely taste different than what other coffee shops may offer. Uh, but it's something that you know I'm proud of and, and a difference that I was willing to, to withstand because I know the, the hard work and the quality of the product that we're able to push out. Don't just take his word for it. Try a mocha or hot chocolate yourself at one of the several Z Beans locations in Georgia. In Bibb County, I'm Jennifer Parson reporting for the Farm Monitor.
Jennifer, thanks so much. Now, before we go, a quick reminder that for all the latest ag news regarding food, recipes, and what's happening on Georgia farms, be sure you check out all of our social media platforms, including farm-monitor.com. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. Stay safe. Have a great week.